If you've been wanting to make a multiplayer game, you're in the right place. In this video, we'll be connecting a client to a server in Unity and sending some data back and forth, and in future parts of this series we'll expand that into a small first person shooter game that you can play with your friends. We'll be using Riptide Networking, which is an open source networking solution that I've been building from scratch over the last year. If you find this video helpful, make sure to like and subscribe, and consider checking out my devlogs where I'm building a multiplayer pirate survival game. Before we jump in, I want to address a few questions that I've been asked a lot in the past, which you may also have. If any of the following information becomes outdated in the future, I'll leave an update in the pinned comment below, so make sure to take a look at that as well. Does Riptide Networking cost money to use? No. Riptide is completely free to use, and it imposes no arbitrary concurrent user limits. You can connect as many players as you like, as long as the hardware your server is running on can handle it, and you have sufficient bandwidth available. That being said, if you'd like to financially support Riptide's development, as well as the making of these tutorials, you can do so through GitHub sponsors or on my Ko-fi page. You can find links to those in the description. What platforms does Riptide work on? This varies depending on which transport you're using. Riptide's default transport works on PC, Mac, Linux, iOS, and Android. I haven't had the opportunity to test on platforms like consoles and VR, and it doesn't work in web browsers, although I may build a web transport at some point in the future. If you end up using Riptide's Steam Transport, which at the time of making this video is functional, but still in development, that will obviously only work on platforms that are supported by Steam. How many players can Riptide support? This is hard to answer, as it depends more on how much data your game needs to send per second per player, and how that compares to the hardware and bandwidth available to your server than anything else. A turn-based card game will obviously be able to handle many more players than a fast-paced shooter or an MMORPG while using the same resources. What's the difference between Riptide and other available options like Mirror? Riptide and Mirror aren't really directly comparable, as they serve somewhat different purposes. Mirror provides a high-level, heavily abstracted API and provides plenty of built-in features that can make building multiplayer games quick and easy. However, when I was using it, I personally felt like it was doing too much for me, and as soon as I wanted to do something that wasn't supported by its built-in features, things got complicated fast. Based on my conversations with others who have used Mirror, I don't seem to be alone in having that experience. Riptide, on the other hand, provides a much lower level API. It handles connections for you and provides methods that deliver data to the other end, but leaves most of the rest up to you. This may sound somewhat unappealing at first, but the level of control you gain is absolutely worth it in my opinion. How does Riptide compare to the solution from your old tutorial series? Riptide is better in literally every single way, and it's not even close. Riptide's code is cleaner and more modular, it's easier to use, faster to set up, it has less bugs, and based on some rough comparisons from early adopters, it uses over 10 times less CPU power than the old solution when doing the exact same thing. With that out of the way, let's actually get started. All the code we're going to write here is available on GitHub, and if you get stuck or have questions, feel free to ask on the Discord server. Those links are in the description as well. Anyways, I've got two empty Unity projects open, one for the server and one for the client, and the only stuff that's in here are the default assets that are part of the URP template project. First things first, I'm just going to delete all the example assets and clean up the sample scene, and I'm going to do this in the client project as well. Now that we've got a clean starting point, create a multiplayer folder in the scripts folder. Then go to the Riptide networking repo on GitHub, go to the releases section, and find version 1.1.0. You can also install Riptide through Unity's package manager, and I would generally recommend doing it that way, however installing git packages through the package manager requires git to be installed on your computer. To avoid making everyone watching this install git, and for the sake of making this video future proof in case something changes with the package manager, we're just going to grab the Riptide networking DLL and XML files and manually add them to our project. Once you've downloaded the two files, just drag and drop them into the multiplayer folder in both projects. After that, in the server project, create four scripts called Network Manager, Message Extensions, Game Logic, and Player. Then in the client project, create the same four scripts, plus another one called UI Manager. Now it's time to write some code. Open the server's network manager and add using statements for the Riptide Networking and Riptide Networking.utils namespaces. First of all, we're just going to create a singleton. This will make it so that we can attach the network manager to a game object and access that specific instance from anywhere in our code. It will also ensure that there will only ever be one instance of the network manager. We're going to need a server property as well as a field for the port and max client count so we can set those in the inspector. 
In the start method, we're going to initialize the Riptide logger class, which will allow log messages from Riptide's internals to be printed to the Unity console so we can actually see them. Then we're going to assign a value to our server property and immediately call its start method to start the server. In fixed update, we need to call server.tick, which will ensure that messages which the server receives are actually handled so we can do something with the incoming data. Finally, we need to call server.stop in on application quit to shut everything down. Back in Unity, create an empty game object, attach the network manager to it, and set the port value to whichever port you want the server to be listening on. It doesn't really matter what number you choose, as long as that port isn't in use by another application running on your computer. For a list of ports used by common applications, you can check out this Wikipedia page. Ideally, you'll want to pick a port that's not on this list. Set the max client count to however many connections you want to allow at any given time. If you hit play now, you should see a log message in the console saying that the server was started. We can also delete the main camera and directional light from the server scene as we don't actually need those, and that will make these missing script warnings go away. Now it's time to connect the client, so open its network manager and copy paste the singleton code from the server. We'll need a client property and make sure to add the Riptide Networking and Riptide Networking.utils namespaces. Then we need two fields for the IP and port which we want to connect to. In the start method, initialize the Riptide logger and assign a value to our client property. In fixed update, we'll call client.tick and in on application quit, we'll call client.disconnect. We'll change this in a moment, but for now just call the client's connect method from start. This method takes a string which needs to contain the host address, and it should be formatted with the IP and port separated by a colon. Back in Unity, create an empty game object and attach the network manager. Set the IP to 127.0.0.1 and the port to whatever you set the port to on the server. Keep in mind that 127.0.0.1 is the local host IP, meaning that using this will only let you connect to the server if it's running on the same computer as the client. If you want to test with another computer on your network, you need to change the IP to the host computer's internal IP, which can be found by typing ipconfig into a command prompt on that computer. If you want to test with a friend outside your network, you'll need to use your public IP which you can find by typing what is my IP into Google. In order to allow connections from outside your network, you'll also need to port forward, which requires access to your router. The process differs depending on your router model, so it's best to just Google how to port forward and include the brand and model in the search. Anyways, at this point we should be able to establish a connection. Press play in the server project, and once that's running, do the same in the client project. You should see a log message on both ends telling you that you've connected successfully. To get rid of these warnings, remove the missing script component from the camera. Now we probably don't want to connect as soon as the client starts up, so let's fix that. Open the UI manager, paste the singleton code into it, and replace the three network manager references with UI manager. We'll need a field for a game object and one for an input field. To automatically add the namespace necessary to access the input field class, right click it, select quick actions and refactorings, and choose the option with the desired fix. When we click our connect button, we want to disable interaction with the username field, hide the connect UI, and call the network manager's connect method, which at this point doesn't exist yet. Let's also add a method that will reset our UI so we can call that when we get disconnected or if a connection attempt fails. Over in the network manager, add a connect method and move the client.connect call into it. Now create a method that takes an object and an event args instance as parameters and make sure you've got a using statement for the system namespace. In here, we're going to call the UI manager's send name method, which we'll create in a moment. Also add two methods that call the UI manager's back to main method. The reason we have two of these is because we're going to add them as subscribers of separate client events, and in the future we'll be adding more code to them which won't be identical. Then subscribe the did connect, failed to connect, and did disconnect methods that we just created to the appropriate client events. Next, create an enum called client to server ID and give it a name element. This enum will contain all the IDs for messages that we send from the client to the server. Back in the UI manager, create a send name method. In here, we'll create our first message. The message class's create method takes in two parameters, the message send mode and the message ID. The send mode is either reliable or unreliable, and it determines how the message will be sent. If you use the reliable mode, Riptide will ensure that your message is delivered to the other end, 
which is good for important data like informing the server of what your username is. If you use the unreliable send mode, Riptide will send your message without any guarantee of delivery. Data is sometimes lost when sending it over the internet, and Riptide won't do anything about it if that happens when using this mode. The reason you might want to use the unreliable send mode is because sending messages reliably comes with a bit more overhead, as Riptide needs to keep track of certain things to detect when a message is lost so it can be resent. Additionally, for some types of data it just doesn't matter if some of it gets lost. Things like player positions, which tend to be sent continuously, can be just fine if messages go missing occasionally. Besides, by the time a message containing a player's position can be resent, a more up-to-date position has probably already made it to the other end, so resending is kind of pointless in that case. The message ID is pretty much exactly what it sounds like, and it's used by the receiving end to determine what to do with incoming messages. After that, we're just going to add the username as a string, and then we'll call the client's send method to send the message to the server. Back in the client's Unity project, add a canvas to the scene. Then add an image, which will be the root game object for the main menu UI. I'm going to add a vertical layout group to it as well, but how you make your UI look is entirely up to you. Next, we need to add an input field for the username as well as a connect button. Finally, attach the UI manager to the canvas and assign its fields in the inspector. Don't forget to add the UI manager's connect clicked method to the connect button's on click event. At this point, starting the server and the client and then clicking connect should connect the client to the server. You'll also notice that clicking the connect button when the server is not running will cause the connect menu to reappear once the connection attempt fails. The next step is to actually handle the message that the client is sending to the server. So copy the client to server ID enum and paste it into the server side network manager. Then open the player class and add using Riptide networking at the top. We'll need a way to access players by their ID, so create a static dictionary. Each player will have an ID and a username. Now to handle the message that contains the username, we're going to need a method with a message handler attribute. This attribute lets Riptide know that messages with the given ID should be handled by the following method. Message handler methods must be static and can be private. The fact that Visual Studio doesn't show any references to it doesn't matter, as Riptide uses reflection to find all methods with message handler attributes in your project. The way we've set things up here, all messages that the server receives which have an ID of 1 will be passed to our name method for handling. Inside, we're just going to call the spawn method and pass it the ID of the client that the message was received from, followed by the username which we get from the message using the getString method. At the moment we don't have a spawn method, so let's deal with that. Inside, we're just going to instantiate a player from the player prefab, which is another thing that doesn't exist yet in our code. Then we'll set the game object's name using the username. However, we'll do a check on the username in case it's an empty string, which happens if you just click connect without entering a name. If you've never seen syntax like this, this is what's called a ternary conditional operator, and it's basically just an inline if statement. It checks the condition, and if it evaluates to true, it uses the first expression, otherwise it uses the second expression. It's essentially the same thing as writing an if-else statement like this one, but on a single line. After that, we need to assign the player's ID and username properties. And finally, we'll add the player to the dictionary. To ensure players are removed from the dictionary when the game object is destroyed, we can make use of the onDestroy method. Over in the network manager, let's make sure to destroy player objects when a client disconnects. We can do this with a method that's subscribed to the server's client disconnected event. Next, copy the singleton code and paste it into the GameLogic class, and make sure to replace the references to the network manager class with GameLogic ones. Then add a field to hold the player prefab, along with a publicly accessible getter so we can access the prefab from elsewhere in our code. Back in Unity, let's create that prefab. Make an empty game object and attach the player script to it. Then add a capsule as a child so that we can actually see something and remove its collider. We'll be dealing with player movement and collisions in the next video, and we won't be needing the capsule collider. Finally, attach the game logic script to the network manager game object, create a prefabs folder, drag the player object into it, delete the player object from the scene, and assign the prefab to the game logic scripts field.
If you run the server now and connect the client, you should see the player being spawned in the server scene. Disconnecting the client should also remove the player from the scene again, and connecting after entering a username should cause the spawn player object to have your username in its name. Obviously, at this point the player is only being spawned on the server. If we want that to happen on the client too, we need the server to send over the necessary information to do so. First up, let's add an enum to store IDs for messages that we're going to send from the server to clients. Then back in the player class, create a method to send our spawn message. Inside, create a reliable message with the player spawned ID and add the player ID and username to it. We also need to add the position so that clients know where to spawn the player, but having to call add float three times is kind of inconvenient, so we can extend the message class instead. However, for Vector3s we can actually just grab some of the code from the GitHub repo, as the Unity package includes a few extension methods that aren't included in the DLL. Just copy and paste this into the message extensions class, and then add the Riptide networking namespace at the top. Back in the player class, we can now call message.addVector3 and pass in the position. To finish it off, we just need to send the message to all connected players, and then we can call player.sendSpawned from the spawn method above. However, this will currently only send the newly spawned player's info to the clients that are already connected. It won't do anything to send the info of the existing players to the new client, so we need to take care of that as well. At the top of the spawn method, add a for each loop and call the send spawn method on each existing player, this time passing in the ID of the newly connected client. Next, add an overload for the send spawn method that takes in a player ID. Now we could just copy paste the message creation code from the other send spawned method, but since these messages will contain identical data, that's not ideal. Instead, we'll make a quick helper method that takes a message instance, adds the data, and then returns the same message. Then in the send spawned method, we can call add spawn data, pass it the created message, and pass that directly to the send to all method. We'll do the same thing in the send spawned overload that takes an ID, but instead of calling send to all, we'll just call the regular send method and pass it the ID of the player we want to send it to. Next, we need to handle the spawn message on the client, so copy the server to client ID enum and paste it over to the client's network manager. Then open the player class, add the Riptide networking namespace at the top, and create a static dictionary to store the players just like on the server. Add properties to store the player ID and whether or not the player is the local player, as well as a field to store the username. Just like on the server, we'll remove the player instance from the dictionary in the onDestroy method. We'll also have a spawn method, this one taking in the player ID, username, and position. Inside, we need to check if the ID of the player we're spawning matches the ID of our client instance, and depending on that we want to instantiate a different prefab and set the isLocal bool. Then we'll set the player's object name, ID, and username, and add them to the dictionary. Now we just need to create a message handler for the player spawned message ID. Inside, we'll call the spawn method, passing it the player ID and username that we get from the message. Something to keep in mind when sending and handling messages is that the order in which you add and retrieve the contents isn't just important, it's critical. On the server, we added a uShort followed by a string and then a vector3. This means we need to retrieve those same types in the exact same order, otherwise there will be issues. Also, to be able to call getVector3, we need to copy paste the message extensions class over to the client. Then we can pass the player position to the spawn method. Next, let's copy the singleton implementation over to the client's game logic class. We'll need two fields, one for the player prefab and one for the local player prefab, along with publicly accessible getters for each. Back in Unity, create an empty game object in the client scene and attach the player script to it. Then add a capsule for the model. In order to be able to tell the difference between local and non-local players, create two materials, give them different colors, and then stick one on the capsule. Remove the capsule's collider, and then create a prefabs folder and drag the player object into it. Delete the player object, duplicate the prefab, and rename it to local player. Stick the other material on this prefabs capsule, and add a camera. Finally, disable the main camera's audio listener, attach the GameLogic script to the network manager, and drag the two player prefabs into their respective slots. Running the server and connecting to it now should result in the player being spawned on both ends. Additionally, if we build the client project so we can connect two clients to the server, 
two player objects should be instantiated on each client and on the server. Since both players are spawned in the same spot, you won't be able to tell that there are two of them in the built player, but in the editor you can move them around in the scene view and clearly see both. There's a couple more small things to do. If you open the stats panel while the server is running, you'll notice that it's churning out way more frames per second than necessary, so let's just quickly limit that. In the network manager's start method, set application.targetFrameRate to 60, and that should take care of it. Then in the client's network manager, we should make sure that when clients disconnect, their player object is destroyed. This can be done really easily by creating a method that's subscribed to the client's client disconnected event. Anyways, I'll leave it there for this video. In the next one, we'll set up player movement, so subscribe and hit the notification bell if you don't want to miss that. And in the meantime, consider checking out my devlogs. Hopefully this was helpful, thank you for watching, and I'll see you again in the next one.